Today, every day, small cap investors visit Agoracom knowing this is the day to discover the world's next great company to have their dreams come true. That's why I take to the open road to find them, to tell their stories, to engage them, to bring them to life because they want to connect with you from your office, your phone, your home, anywhere. Agoracom, find your dream. Welcome to Beyond the Press Release, a production of Agoracom, in which we take the time to speak with small cap CEOs right after they put out important news. And trust me, this is one of those scenarios with us today. Paul Gezi, he's CEO of Control Energy. The company trades on the CSC out of the stock symbol KNR. For those of you who are new to the story, and that's going to be a lot of you because Control's got a lot of attention given the fact that it just hit a new all-time high on Friday. Basically, the company... If Google Nest is the leader in smart home technology, Control Energy is a small cap leader in smart building technology. Now, more than just lip service, they've got tier one clients, including Beyond Meat, Oxford Properties, Brookfield Asset Management, and so on and so forth. But the story that's been stealing the show as of late is their, is Control BioCloud. Now, it's a real-time analyzer design, designed to detect airborne viruses. Uh, the system works, so the viruses are detected, alert systems are created, and the company announced on, fr on Friday, I'm going to read this, Control's COVID-19 technology receives positive lab results for live COVID-19 testing. Paul, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, to be, thanks, thanks uh, for having me. Yeah, well, this is big, right? Look, the stock closed up 63% for a reason on Friday uh, to an all-time high, just under $5 on almost four and a half million shares. Clearly, this is important to the market. Let's talk about it. Before I get into any numbers or anything, how big is this from a significance, technological significance point of view? Yeah, so thanks for that. So look, since Friday, um, I, I haven't gotten much sleep. <laughs> so we've been uh, overwhelmed um, opportunities coming at us from everywhere globally. Uh, the story has gone viral, which is fantastic. You know, great for shareholders. So look, if we think about where the world is today in the grand scheme, you know, what are we all worried about? We're all worried about being safe in the spaces that we're in, right? So uh, the idea of a safe space technology where you can feel comfortable, that you're protected, um, and that's really what we've designed with Control BioCloud is not an individual testing uh, technology, but an area testing, sampling air over time and looking for you know, anything that's in the air as a pathogen. Right now, the focus is COVID because that's what the world is focused on and what we're all worried about. So it, for us, it's, it's huge significance for control and I think it's huge for the global economy. And we're talking big buildings, government buildings, schools, arenas, that's the, that's a scale that we're thinking about for bio. Yeah, so look, I, we define it as this, right? Any space where people gather, uh, where you're concerned about your safety and it's, it's over time. So for example, classrooms, which you know, tend to be about 1,000 square feet. They have 15 to 18 students in them. Over the period of about an hour, you know, everyone's gonna have their breath recycled in that, in that environment. Um, so we're much more focused on smaller spaces. So schools, healthcare, hospitals, uh, transportation, less focused on very large buildings because yeah. in a large building, you know, they may be 20% vacant right now. The floor space may be very large. So we call this more a confined area technology, which I think is very important because if you're in a space where other people are breathing or coughing or sneezing, you want to know there's some kind of level of protection or detection for you as an individual, right? That's all about feeling safe in that space. Let's talk about a little bit because a lot of people are asking because all of a sudden control energy is popping up on everybody's radar. Even I was getting calls all weekend while I was driving to and from the cottage. Share with us a little bit in layman's terms uh, how the technology works. Yeah, so what, you know, this is new. Most people looking at us now say, well, where did this come from? So we can say we started this in March and we started asking the question, you know, can we measure for viruses like COVID using a similar technology that we use for air quality, emissions, particulate level, things that shouldn't be in the air. So control has a long history of being in energy management, but also air quality and continuous emissions. 
So that journey started in March. So there's two processes that make up our technology. One is mechanical and one, the other one we'll call science-based. On the mechanical side, we're very well equipped. We have a great history in knowing how to sample air in real time and look for things that shouldn't be there. So we know that, right? That, that's the easy part for us. The harder part was what is the science of detecting COVID using that system? So that's where we work with two independent labs since March, you know, doing a, a lot of testing. We announced that testing in succession. So it was uh, dormant COVID with our detection chamber, dormant COVID with our prototype, and then live COVID. But included in those tests are a myriad of other tests that we aggregate up. So we feel very comfortable that we're now here. We've got these, the, the mechanical side and we've got the science side. So together, what we're basically doing is drawing air into our system in a room and sampling that and testing that over time. And we've got a detection chamber, which is proprietary that we're gonna patent, which basically collects the air and is looking for the virus on a volume basis. So again, we're not testing individuals, it's the air in the room. And if you think about an airplane, within about 15 minutes, you're breathing the air of everyone else who's on that airplane. Right. So that's very important, right? And so uh, I'll give you an example. Um, I think JetBlue is spending $50 million with Honeywell to put on UV systems that hopefully capture and kill COVID, but they can't say it does. And so, you know, why are they spending that kind of money on a system they're not really sure is gonna have an effect? It's because people don't feel safe getting on a plane right now. So our technology is really designed to answer that fundamental problem. Can I be safe in this particular space? So the big question that everyone's asking at home as, I'm, as we're doing this interview right now, your shareholders is, all right, uh, obviously the market's had a very big reaction to it. There's some great quotes in your press release. Uh, it's clear that they're, you know, you're, you're losing sleep just from the number of calls that you're getting around <laughs> the world. So the question is this, I'm going to read it. How, people ask, okay, how big can this be in terms of now let's talk about numbers. And you say in the press release, control is not making any statements or assumption about potential revenue. So you're not doing that. However, you are planning for up to 20,000 BioCloud units per month as manufacturing capacity. And given the kind of business you guys have run up until now, uh, you know, really prudent. Uh, you do everything, you know, really, uh, really well. I I'm assuming you just didn't pick those numbers out of a hat. Uh, how did you get, what were some of the assumptions that went into that as a capacity number per month? For sure. So look, what, what we basically said, there's two things we're working on. One is the groups that we're talking to. So whether it's government or industry, you know, Canada or global, we have a certain sense of demand for this type of technology, right? So without saying it's revenue, we have a sense of the demand. So then we look at, you know, if we receive a lead order, what could we produce at control and, and what are we missing in terms of capacity? So as we firmed up our global supply chain, and built our prototypes, the question we started asking ourselves is, how would we deal with a, a lead order that overwhelms us? So we went out to two contract manufacturers. Uh, we haven't fully completed negotiations, but we're very close on, could they each fulfill 10,000 units a month? And so that gives us the ability now to go back and say to some of these groups we're talking to, if you gave us a lead order, here's the capacity we're building in our system. So those two things go together, right? So if you don't have the capacity set up, the chances of someone feeling comfortable, you know, placing a lead order is pretty low. Uh, on the other hand, if you wait for the lead order and then you're scrambling to manufacture, you're going to be in a bind. Yeah. So the idea here was to get a sense of our market, get a sense of the opportunity in those conversations we're having and start to think about the kind of capacity. So we call it redundant capacity. What could we need up to a certain number? And so it makes us feel more comfortable now to say, hey, we're ready to go. Here's what we can do. Here's the amount of units we can produce a month. What's your order? So that, that's why we did that. So let's talk about that. I would love it. Like I'm a shareholder of the company. I would love it. Uh, I, I would love to dream and say, today you got an order for 5,000 units and you ship them tomorrow. But we know <laughs> the world doesn't work that way. Yeah. Uh, now you're in this process. So what does the next 30 to 60 days look like for control? Yeah, so we're highly focused on moving to the commercialization process, which, you know, is basically a CSA approval, which, you know, is electrical safety and the products compliant, um, getting the supply chain all ready to go for those number of units per month, working hard on a number of uh, discussions and conversations we're having with various groups that could, you know, buy, buy a large lead order. The, the concept for us is we're not selling onesies and twosies, right? So we've, we've been approached by 
organizations globally, some of them are competitors, you know, could we buy two units, could we buy five units? We don't consider those. And the reason is we're gonna protect the technology through a large lead order, and we're gonna protect the technology through a patent down the road. However, a patent doesn't protect your business from a revenue perspective, right? So the idea here is we're not gonna sell onesies and twosies. We're looking for something larger. And, and then that's you know, a real focus on that you know, certification and getting into production. Because if you think about what's happening right now, and you can see the news popping up every day um, globally. So Israel, new shutdown, yeah. uh, higher cases in Quebec, higher cases in Ontario. We're gonna to get to the point here where the flu season is commingling with COVID. And it's gonna create some chaos. I'm not gonna predict what that chaos is, but you can see it ramping up you know, from the summer lull. We're getting way more news flow. Absolutely. I'm right? seizing November and people are getting afraid that. Exactly. Uh, so that's kind of driving the interest in control, the conversations we're having, the groups reaching out. And uh, what I can say is we've been overwhelmed by the response, which is fantastic. But you've got to execute on the business. And so we're really hyper focused on the execution over the next 45 days. Are you now this is going to be a massive enterprise, right? Uh, and anything of this scale requires capital. Are you guys going to need to go raise capital? Uh, how do you finance? Okay, George Com comes along and says, "Paul, yeah, I want, I want 500 units this month, and I want another 500 units in in December." How do you finance all that? How do how do the how do the mechanics look like for that? Yeah, great question. So I mean, so you know you know a little bit about our philosophy, right? We're very prudent guys. We're, we're very tight with our money management, and the approach that we're taking is we have cash on the balance sheet right now, but two 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 and a quarter million. Uh, we're cash. We're running cash flow uh, positive in operations. On a, from a commercialization perspective, to get to commercialization, we don't need to raise any capital, right? So we can take this to commercialization. So now what happens is a couple things can happen. There's there could be some government funding. I'm not saying there is or there isn't, but it's a possibility. And let's look at a lead order. Let's say you get a lead order of fifty million dollars. You take a deposit on that, a significant deposit, which becomes your working capital. So we're in a very unique position here where we don't need to raise capital and we can be very careful uh, about how we do that. We can work with lead orders. There may be some government funding, which is all to say that's very good for control shareholders, right? And so, as you know, one of my core themes is non-dilution. There's only 31 million shares basic outstanding. You know, management has a huge position. Management and the board have a huge position, about 44%. We don't believe in diluting the company, you know, without a purpose. And so we view this as um, we can keep going here without raising capital and just drive the business forward and create value for shareholders. And that's the great thing about when management, our operators and shareholders, that we're all aligned with our shareholders, right? Because we want the same thing. So. And I like the fact that you've got both price and term control or at least leverage, right? Because if George Calm wants 500 units, you can look at George Com and say, hey, George, you guys are going to have to give a massive deposit on this so that right. you can have the working capital. You don't have to dip into your own pocket. That's right. And right. you don't That's take on even receivables risk because maybe That's George right. Com is a massive restaurant chain, for example, right. and maybe he's not around right. four, five, six months from now. Uh, yeah, that and, is and what I can also add to that, and we've had some discussions around this, you know, a large lead order could also come with government funding of working capital, right? That, that's an easy one. Like, get your order here's your money. So there's really many different ways that we could look at this where we're not diluting. And that's very important to me, you know, as an operator, but also as a key shareholder and to drive value. Last question. You've come really far, really fast. I mean, I think you let the world know about BioCloud on August 5th or so, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it was around right. the end of July. Yeah. End of July. Yeah, right. End of July. And we did our first interview a few days right. later. Right. So, I mean, we're, the, we're in mid September right now. 45 days you've come really far really fast what is the next wh when you talk to shareholders what are your final words here on what the next uh three to six months look like yeah so look from our perspective we've been working since march 18 hours a day right so it feels really long to me <laughs> but i understand from the public side you know it looks really quick but there's a lot of work a lot of effort you know a great team effort that went into this so what we're super focused on is we know that right now the entire global economy is worried about safe spaces, right? We know that that's the feedback we get. We see it in the news. We're worried about our kids. We're worried about our parents. You know, we're worried about going out. We're worried about where we spend time. So from that perspective, our focus is, you know, we've got our core energy management business. 
which is doing well and continues to grow, although a little slower because of the COVID environment. Now we've got a new uh, COVID technology. So the 100% focus here is to grow revenues, right? To become a, a market leader and to create shareholder value and do all the hard work behind the scenes that drives that. Paul, congratulations to you and the entire team. Thanks for meeting us here Monday morning, bright and early, as I know what your weekend was like, and we wish you guys nothing but continued success until we talk again. Thanks, George. Appreciate it. Thank you. You've been watching, or if you've been listening by podcast, Paul Gezzi, CEO of Control Energy, trades on the CSC and the stock symbol KNR for our friends in the U.S., KNRLF. Now, look, today is also coincidentally what I like to call the first day of investing season. It's always the first Monday after Labor Day. Everybody's back. Nobody's on vacation. All the kids are tucked into school and or homeschooling and away they go. So it's up to you now to really dig in and do your due diligence here. You can start that on Agoracom, get to the profile page of Control Energy. We've got everything laid out there for you because we know some of these concepts are difficult to wrap your minds around, but do your due diligence there, hop over to the company site, and hopefully you've discovered your next amazing small cap company. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Have a fantastic day. See you next time.